Hello and welcome. We're going to be talking tonight about what you might call a heavy topic. We're going to be talking about death and dying, but more specifically about how family members and loved ones can communicate um, more lovingly and more effectively with the person who is dying. With me is Sheila Duddy, and Sheila's come to me with high recommendation uh, as someone who understands this process. She is a hospice nurse educator with Alina. Um, she's worked there 10 years, you told me, and um, you've worked there in several capacities, but as an educator the last few years? Yes, I, uh, I started off uh, as a mix of a casual um, uh, uh, nurse uh, going out to see uh, families and the patients and, uh, and in addition in teaching education during orientation. Then I just did for a couple of years hospice admissions and uh, now I'm doing hospice education. Um, interestingly enough, she has also worked her first part of her career with um, children and babies and, and pregnant mothers yeah. and so she said she's working or has worked from womb to tomb. <laughs> and it's a catchy, catchy way to remember that. Well, a lot of people who I bet you meet, this is a guess, but I bet they say, oh, isn't it depressing working with people who are dying? And what do you say to that? Well, um, I say it, it's a truly an honor and a privilege to be able to work with uh, patients and families um, at this stage of life. Uh, I, I felt the same way when I was working obstetrics, welcoming people into the world. Um, and in this stage, it's about family, it's about transition, and we're saying goodbye to somebody uh, in the world. And in one of your, your written correspondence to me, um, you said something about helping people live well and die well. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was struck by that because there are times when people don't die well, aren't there? There are times when people don't die well. Um, with, with, I think, the uh, help of uh, hospice, uh, people um, uh, can certainly uh, do much reconciliation with their lives. Uh, and when it comes to those final stages, being able to say, I love you, being able to ask for forgiveness and to forgive, mm -hmm. uh, to have found gratitude in life and a legacy well, well lived, um, and uh, then to be able to say goodbye and, and to let go of this world, uh, that leads to an acceptance and a, uh, a passing uh, that can be quite peaceful. So in hospice, we consider this living well. Uh, you can't be alive and dead at the same time. <laughs> That's uh, so true. They're not <laughs> compatible, are they? They're not they? compatible. Uh -huh. so, so we're looking at quality of life and comfort. And uh, given the circumstances where people are very sick, it's still possible to have that. Uh, and those are the things that we strive for. Oh. When you say reconciliation, that's a big word. And I'm wondering, have you seen a lot of people who are in the dying process be able to, to have that experience with a loved one or, or someone that they've been in relationship with? Yeah, uh, and that takes uh, process and time. And I think uh, one of the things that is more difficult, uh, I would say, in our culture is that we don't necessarily accept death. Yes. Uh, and if we don't accept it or we're denying that this is happening, then you don't get to reconcile. Why would you need to reconcile if nothing's right, going on? Right. Um, so <laughs> that's one of those things that, that happens sometimes at the very end uh, when people really are, are, are pulled into the whole experience and recognize that there is not tomorrow. There's not going to be another time to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you live with this for the rest of your life, um, knowing that you were able to tell that person that you loved them and that you were grateful and that you've, you found forgiveness. Um, as a hospice nurse, maybe not as an educator, because you're not maybe working as directly with the families, but as a nurse, would you help facilitate that kind of big discussion well, the, uh, yes, and as part of a beautiful multidisciplinary team. 
Um, therein lies the beauty of hospice. Uh, that hospice isn't just about a nurse and a doctor, but it's also about uh, spiritual the spiritual care. So we have spiritual support. Uh, some are chaplains. We, we try to represent all uh, denominations and no denominations. Uh, mm -hmm. So everybody is um, uh, equal at the table. We have music and massage uh, for, for patients. Uh, volunteers come in to, to do. So we're looking at a whole person um, and um, each person engages with that patient and family in a different way and pulls out different stories of what's important to them and when we find out what's really important to them then we try to mm. find that reconciliation. Mm. Um, I so it might be the chaplain that would find that out. It yeah. might be a volunteer, right? It might be the music therapist. A home health aide. Uh -huh. um, okay. so, so each one of us is trained in terms of, of uh, really listening. I, I think the greatest gift that we can provide is truly to listen to what that person uh, is saying and what their needs are, not necessarily imposing our stuff on them. Uh, but it, maybe there's a, um, a daughter that has been disenfranchised from the family, um, and um, there, there can be some reconciliation at the end. Um, we get people out of prison to come see grandma before mm -hmm. uh, she passes. So we've brought uh, soldiers back uh, from uh, Afghanistan to see uh, their mom. Uh, these, are, these are really important times. And um, can you know, the hospice, well, I'm sorry, jumping in here, but can the hospice staff make that happen? Um, make it more likely to happen? Or mm -hmm. does it have to start with the family? making all the arrangements, let's say for a prison, um, someone in prison to be released to, to say goodbye, or a soldier? We all work together. Okay. So with the, fa with the family support, uh, we're, we have the free time, we have the time that we can go uh, and start to, to work the system, <laughs> which is kind uh -huh. of what, what you have to do. Uh -huh. So with the family support, knowing what's going on, um, then we do our very best. So this is where our social workers and um, uh, whatever uh, power we need to use uh, to make this happen, I think when you say to, some, to the army or whatever, this is the last chance, um, they're gonna do everything that they can. And you found that back. to be true. Oh, yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. You know, we do hear some stories on the news about things like that, but not yeah. real often. Yeah. So I didn't know, you know, perhaps it's going on way more than I realized. That's, yeah. that's I don't good. have any n numbers per se uh, mm -hmm. on but that, it, but um, whatever we can do to, to, um, Oh, to make that person happy, you know, you know? Um, so I, I think a lot of people look at uh, hospice as being very sad and depressing. That's how you started um, uh, with your question. And um, I, I always say, I love it. It's an honor. Um, I have, these are my teachers. Mm -hmm. I have learned so much. I can bring some things to the table. Uh, but uh, I have learned so much more from uh, these patients and, and families about what is important in life and living uh, our lives to the fullest and do not assuming. <laughs> do you feel like you accept your personal leaving of this earth more because of this work? Um, I do. Uh, I think I do. And so maybe <laughs> I haven't gotten any diagnosis yet. So, you know, there's always that. Um, but all my life I've been preparing for this. Um, my best friend in second grade died uh, of a brain tumor. Uh, and that was very, very devastating um, to me. Um, I used to go ride my Little bicycle. Seven-year-old girls. Yeah. Aww. Ride my bicycle to, um, to her house uh, during the summer. Uh, what I would say was uh, very fortunate for me, and I, uh, you know, uh, in, in second grade, I was at Catholic school. The nuns walked us through the whole what death was, mm -hmm. and of course in a religious context, but they took us over, the funeral uh, uh, parlor was across the street. Oh. She was in her uh, confirmation gown, or first communion gown. And so they had us participate in that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that they pushed us away. Uh, that didn't happen or we didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a great lesson, I think. That took me through all of my, my uh, uh -huh. life in terms of what is this death? 
Um, and how do I live my life knowing that at some point I will pass? I just want to go back to your statement that in our country, we are perhaps denying death mm. more than, and here's my question, more than most countries, more than some countries. What would you say, Sheila? Well, <laughs> uh, I don't, can you just package Western civilization, perhaps, okay. um, uh, in that? And uh, so I can only really speak for for this country, but. Um, um, yes, we, we, we have uh, focused a lot on youth and um, um, we don't like to see things that don't, um, are broken, as it were. Uh, it, it, it's, it's um, I, I, I guess what I just want to sort of simply say is um, we, d we don't see the full life cycle. We're, we're kind of pushing the death piece away, and in that, um, uh, we don't see very many older people, I, I think, out in the community as much as you used to. Everybody seems to be in assisted livings or nursing homes. I grew up in a small town. There were elderly people all over the place. I used to go to the farmer's market. They were downtown. Um, so um, here in our world, we don't necessarily see how people age and, um, and pass. Do you feel, Sheila, that when people have some time uh, before they die, knowing they're going to die, maybe a terminal you know, diagnosis, um, do they start accepting dying more as time goes on? Oh, boy. Uh, well, you know, everyone's a, a, an individual. And I think to the point where a person uh, comes to an acceptance, it's a lot based on the kind of work or thoughts they've done before, mm -hmm. either in a, a religious context, in terms of uh, their church teachings and things like that. And, and uh, I think once somebody gets close, and usually somebody doesn't even look like they're dying until about three weeks or so before um, they actually pass. Um, I've not come across uh, too many statistics in terms of like the percentage of people that um, ultimately do accept um, the the meaning of death, the meaning of life, and and uh, come to that. I think when a person, so we've had people in hospice, it, the eligibility is six months, but so, you know if you continue to decline, then you get another six months. So we've had people in hospice for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard of people uh, like that. Sure. Um, and um, and for those people, I think um, they get to know there there is a gradual acceptance. They're supported by a whole, as I, we talked about before, a, a multidisciplinary team. So you have lots of different ways that 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 we're approaching that and we're listening and and supporting the family. And I think given that supportive context and acceptance by a group of people, mm -hmm. then it makes it easier for that person and that family to come to that acceptance because they have the support. They have somebody they can talk to. Um, there's, that's the beauty of, of the, the, the end of the journey with support. I read in the papers sometimes, she died or he died a peaceful death. And when we were thinking about doing this interview, I started thinking, now what does that mean? Or what does it mean to you? Because mm. it's really stated quite often. Yeah. And I, I guess I am not sure what that would mean for a person. Yeah. Uh, a peaceful death is a death where, uh, one, the um, whatever medical, the pain and symptoms are managed. They're managed so that the person can then engage with the experience and then do the reconciliation mm -hmm. that we, we talked about before. Um, when the family feels that they're able to express their fears, their worries, and their concerns, and that they have a place that they can um, ex express that, um, where um, they can uh, learn to ultimately let go um, in with a supportive uh, group, then that does lead to a more uh, peaceful. Now you're saying when they, do you mean the person dying and the family or? Yeah, the, the, or those, are the, those are the key <coughs> elements. Or, um, or, but it can sometimes just be the person dying accepts that he or she is dying, the family maybe doesn't, right? 
uh, that can be that's, that can be very true. Um, or if you have a large family, some do. Right, uh, right. Some are on all extremes, sure. and um, and actually can lead to some family discord after that person uh, finally does die, because then there's blame. Or uh, before they die too. I well, there's I that hear too. of that too, where yeah. someone doesn't think mother needs to go to a nursing home or a hospital. Right. Someone else in the family. You know, does etc. Right, uh, and so so I love family conferences. Uh, I love for the whole. And nowadays, uh, you can bring in Skype, and you can. Mm -hmm. We have smartphones, so there's not the disenfranchised child uh, left out of things. Everybody can can hear, uh, but it's the person that has the disease that gets to call the shots, as long as they can call the shots. Um, but it's important for them to let their family know what is important to them. What's really important to me now? What are my values? What are my beliefs? And how do I need to be supported? Where do I want to die? Right. In the hospital, in a hospice setting, in my own apartment, et cetera, right. right? Right, and most people want to die in their home. I bet. Um, you know, your, your home, you create your whole right, lifetime. Right. You've got your pictures of your vacation and all the little Church right. keys that you've collected all on the your, memories yeah, are it's surrounding all, it's you. It's all there. Um, so uh, as much as we can, um, even if somebody's seriously ill in the hospital, um, and, but they do want to go home, we're going to try everything that we can. Um, what's happening nowadays? A lot of families are, you know, working, and so it's hard to to be at home. You still need a caregiver. Um, with hospice, you know, we come in, but we don't move in. To the house, right. you're, you're coming. So you're we're coming, coming visit, in for a visit. You? We're supplementing. <clears throat> we're training. We're supporting. We're guiding. Um, so the family might need a uh, home health aide or nurse there all the time if they can't be. Uh, some some families would have to supplement uh, with that. And there are organizations uh, like in kindergarten. We work with everybody. We like to get along with everybody. And and what is most important in in this experience is that person and their family to make sure that they have what it is that they need. I remember once talking with a a man. I didn't know him well, but he said to me, "Mary, my family just does not want to talk with me at all about my dying." But he mm -hmm. said, "I know I am." And he said, it really makes me feel lonely and mm -hmm. isolated. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so um, interesting that he said it out loud and so helpful in a way to know that, oh, that yeah. he was feeling that way. Um, but is that common that the, the person dying is ahead in the process of acceptance, yeah. ahead of the family? Yeah. Um, when you read the writings of uh, Dame Cicely Saunders, uh, or I should call her Dame Doctor Cicely Saunders, she's the mm -hmm. founder of hospice. She mm -hmm. put the whole uh, system. She learned from the dying because she sat and listened to thousands and thousands of people talk about uh, what it was uh, that they needed. Kubler-Ross did the same thing, primarily with children. But both of them all said the person that was dying knew they were dying about mm. six months before they actually passed. Really? But they didn't want to upset the family. They didn't want to, you know, they were going to wait until the doctor said something or, you know. But they all kind of had this underlying feeling that this, this was, mm. this was uh, the time. Mm. What do you think it is that's telling them that? I, I don't know. I, try, I, I did this with my, my mom. Um, she and I had a, I was the youngest of five, and um, she was 83. And, I, you know, we would talk about these kind of things. And so when I would talk to her, I'm like, is it time? She goes, no, 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 no. Uh -huh. So um, I'll never forget it. I was at the state fair, and uh, my sister called me and said, you know, mom was at home, and she hadn't been eating and, and not doing very well, that they were going to have to take her in. I'm like, put her on the phone. And I said, mom, is this it? And she said, yeah. Uh -huh. And she died three months later. Uh -huh. So she knew so she somehow. Knew. She knew. Yeah, yeah. that's so, so interesting. I, you know, what, it, what I always loved about birth and death, there's a mystery. And um, I, I'm humble, I think we're all humble before it. Um, and why people, I think, fear death so much is that there's this loss of control. Yes. Um, and I think one of the and things the that. The fear of the unknown. Well, the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Going back to this abandonment. 
and isolation um, and loneliness. And when you don't talk to somebody or you try mm. to, to, oh, I don't want to upset Protect. him, I don't want to go there, and you're pretending uh -huh. that everything's okay, but you're really taking away something that is so unique for them, something that they need to be able to talk. Mm. Um, and so maybe all you need to do is listen. Mm -hmm. But don't, if, if you shut them down, um, I think that's, that's a terrible tragedy. So listen, even if you don't agree with the person and don't believe them, perhaps. Just still let them talk. Well, it's sort of like being, learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Hmm, that's a good way to put it, <laughs> Sheila. Uh, uh, so sometimes you don't know what to say, and sometimes there's not much to say. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there, there's a skill in terms of, of being able to listen to somebody, and, and, and just your presence um, says a whole lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot right. of times just showing that, up. Yeah, a lot of times there. the friends go. Um, who you thought were all your connections um, are starting to just slowly uh, disappear. I think the, the the two people that I always think about that I think did fairly well, John McCain, um, mm -hmm. he brought everybody in and, yes. and it was all about telling stories and being with him and saying goodbye and all of those things. Uh, I think Steve Jobs kind of did the same thing towards oh. the, at the end too. So where, some models for us. Yes, um, mm -hmm. that, that um, you need to be able to have these connections and reconnections uh, at the end. Uh, what was my life? How did I influence you? How did you influence me? I want to be able to say thank you to people too. Yes, yes. Um, that so, sounds wonderful. So sometimes we think like death and dying is, is so very negative and tragic and, and yes, it's a terrible great loss. But in that experience, in that last tail end of this journey, is a richness that you're not going to get anywhere mm. and, and not to pass that up. You don't have the time. I don't have tomorrow. So that's part of a good death then, isn't it? I, yes. Um, some of the things to look for that are perhaps more physical at the very end, um, I know you speak about delirium and about seeing, sometimes seeing other people who have died in your family. Right, um, right. Can you speak a little bit about those kind of experiences. Yes, um, uh, so uh, I actually did a, a, a presentation for um, uh, the state for this, Deathbed Visions and Dreams. And so the important piece is to, to know that towards the end, um, there is elements of delirium which, is, which needs to be dealt with and needs to be identified. But that's very different than um, seeing your mother or seeing your husband or your favorite pet um, before you go. So statistically, only about 10% of people are actually conscious towards the end at, mm -hmm. in, in those last moments. But of those 10%, 60, up to 60% of them are having visions and dreams. Really? Of, um, of experiences and people. And what it is is those people on the other side say, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. So that and would be okay. really reassuring Correct. for the dying person. Right. Um, and do you really believe, Sheila, that it's not just wishful thinking? Do you believe that they really are in communication in some way? Um, I, I personally do. Okay. <laughs> I do. Um, now they are doing research uh, in this up in, uh, in Buffalo, uh, Dr. Uh, I think his name is Christopher Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R. Uh, and what they're saying is uh, that they've looked, um, they're working with the nurses and the families and, and actually listening to the patients again, asking, are you having any dreams or visions? And what they're finding is that in, say, the last 30 days, the more frequent that they start to have the dreams and visions, 89% of those people that have those visions and dreams go on to have what's identified by everyone, a very peaceful and beautiful death. Mm -hmm. Because oh, it comes to an acceptance, because... So they on relax the, into it, kind yeah. of. Well, if I saw my mom on the other side, too, right, I'd go, right. and she's okay, I'm like, uh -huh. okay, because I got a sick body on this end. Right, this is right. the, the body is what I have to <clears throat> let go of. But somewhere there's a spirit and there's something else that, that seems to go on. But that's, that's encouraging, isn't that encouraging? Um, 
we've just got a minute left or so, but just in a tight sentence, can you tell me, how do you define delirium then? You said it's very different than what you're talking about now. Yeah. The delirium is a more uh, acute, abrupt, agitated state. Um, mm. They are confused. They are not, not peaceful. Th this is not a peaceful state. This mm. is this is very upsetting to the person and for anybody uh, watching that. Um, and that's a common um, element. Can, uh, uh, um, as far as uh, numbers go, it's there. Um, okay. and, and people sometimes will have just a general restlessness uh, or picking, they'll pick it and throw covers off and things like that. Uh, sometimes if there's a restlessness and a disturbance, there might be a spiritual uh, piece or something that's left undone, mm. which is why I always go back to have the conversations when you can have the conversations. Um, and, um, and so sometimes, you know, there, there's... Um, we bring in spiritual care towards, especially sure. towards the very end, to, to, to see if that is, is not it. With the dreams and visions, I can stop, uh, you know, in the midst and um, return to you and let you know that my mother's there and everything's fine, and I'm not upset. Well, this is fascinating. I wish we had more time. Um, quickly, can you give us your website for Elena um, Hospice uh, Center and also the best phone number okay. to reach reach you or someone in the department? So alinahealth.org uh, um, and then you put in the search engine hospice and okay. um, that, that will, will right bring up. you up um, and you can see all the uh, wonderful services that we have. Uh, the phone number uh, is 651-635-9173. Um, and you can talk to somebody about a referral. Well, thank you so much, Sheila. Oh, um, this has been welcome. important, good information, and we don't talk enough about no, this don't. in general, do we? Thank you for sticking with us. I bet you've been interested like I have been learning from Sheila. Um, have a good week, and I will see you hopefully next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>